A warm welcome to today's talk, Friday the 10th of June. Now, I found today's topic particularly uh, interesting. And I'll tell you what it's about and you can decide if you want to watch. Now, there's a group of genes that we have inherited from interbreeding events with Neanderthals a long, long time ago, about 60,000 years ago. And these genes have been passed down. And these genes are determining people's level of resistance to SARS coronavirus 2. And this is one of the fascinating new things that have been learned from the pandemic. I had no idea about this form of immunity up until really quite recently. Now, the immunity we're talking about today does, does apply specifically to SARS coronavirus 2. But it probably applies to all sorts of different viral infections. So it really is something new that we have uh, learnt. So if you want to watch, that, that's what this is about. Now, this has come from various headlines. Uh, this is the least salacious one I could find. Neanderthal genes probably caused uh, up to a million uh, COVID deaths. A lot of them talked about the, the event where there was uh, integration of the human and Neanderthal genes all that time ago. Um, but up to a million COVID deaths could be caused by this genetic variation. And uh, I'll just show you, actually, just at this stage, just to give a bit of background. So th th this, uh, this red here represents the, uh, the gene that predisposes towards more serious infection and actually doubles the probability of death, doubles the probability of death. Uh, and where these uh, populations live... So we see, for example, people in southern India, a lot of them have this gene or this gene sequence, which increases the probability that they're going to get severe disease and uh, death, particularly uh, Bangladesh, very, very prone to that. Europe, uh, it's variable. Um, th these proportions here are made up partly of the uh, population that's been in Europe for a longer period of time and partly of uh, recently migrated population. So it's kind of an aggregate effect. Lower levels generally in the United States. Now, this is the genetic risk, of course. Now, interestingly, uh, Africa, there's essentially zero genetic risk. Now, this is because um, modern humans uh, interbred with Neanderthals as they left Africa and didn't go back in at least to sub-Saharan Africa. So people in, in Afri the traditional African gene pools, uh, they're, they're not interrelated with Neanderthals the way the rest of the population is. So if you're like a Chinese or American Indian or um, white European or Chinese or Aboriginal or um, <laughs> anything that's not black African, you, you've got Neanderthal genes, typically 2 to 3% of Neanderthal genes. That's what we've all got quite quite fascinating really um so this is the this is the map here and and it does show one reason this has got to be a major reason why our fears about africa were not realized there's a very low genetic potential for severe disease and death in africa and of course this should immunize this should influence immunization decisions as as well we also notice fairly low rates in eastern asia so this is encouraging. We know that very, low, very, very low death rates in Japan, for example. And um, the North Korea situation, again, they've got very low numbers of uh, this predisposition gene, as indeed have people in China. So we can be more hopeful than we have been on recent videos that um, these populations might not suffer as many deaths as we had feared. It's not the only factor, of course. This is the genetic factor. We know about the environmental factors, the diabetes, the heart disease, the kidney disease, the obesity, the hypertension. These are well rehearsed, the vitamin D deficiency. Um, but this is about the genetic uh, predisposition. So I thought that was quite an interesting graphic there that shows the different places where uh, this is uh, prevalent. Now... Um, this is from the gene affected here is snazzily named LZTFL1. Um, uh, and this is published in Nature, which, of course, is with a premier uh, scientific journal, really. Uh, the majority of genetic risk factor for severe COVID is inherited from Neanderthals. Now, these are the group of uh, ancient uh, humans um, that were first discovered in the uh, Neander Valley in Germany. Now, there's a misconception that human beings descended from Neanderthals. We didn't. 
we didn't. They are a cousin species. And it's estimated that we last had a common ancestor 550,000 years ago, just over half a million years ago. Well, what's actually happened, it's not that we're descended from Neanderthals, but we interbred with them when we came into contact in the early stages of human migrations out of Africa. Is, is That's a rough, r- roughly my understanding of the history. So clinical manifestations, as we know with COVID, range from asymptomatic to rapidly progressive respiratory failure. And these can't always be counted, explained by the comorbidities. To an extent they can, but not fully. Now, this comes from the particular gene sequence here is a region or a gene cluster on chromosome 3. Now, here we have the, uh, the human chromosomes. This is called the human carrier type. And uh, this is the one I used in my uh, biology degree. And I was given this picture by my genetics teacher. I remember it well. And he told us to cut them all out and arrange them in pairs which we duly did. It took a long time. But here we have them all in pairs. So these are pair first ones, second ones, third ones. And this is actually the X chromosome and the Y chromosome there, telling you this came from a a male. But this is on the third chromosome, so it's on these chromosomes here, the third pair of chromosomes. And uh, you get one from your mum, one from your dad. So that's where this gene uh, grouping is on chromosome 3. Um, region 3 only region that is significantly associated with severity now this is pretty complicated science what what groupings have done is they've looked at large samples of people who have had severe disease and they've worked out what their genetics is and this is the only significant correlation now in the early days many correlations were suggested but this is the only one that sort of uh, panned out to be true so the odds ratio if you have this gene sequence from Neanderthals Uh, 1.6 more likely to be hospitalised, twice as likely to die. So really quite a significant risk. So this is a genome-wide association study published in Nature. This is a separate study. They took 3,199 people hospitalised with uh, COVID-19 with severe disease. They compared that against a population control of 897,000 people. A pretty good study. And this graphic is what they found. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of the units here, but uh, this is chromosome 1, chromosome 2, chromosome 3, chromosome 4, all the way up to uh, 22 up there. They don't include the X and the Y. And this cluster in chromosome 3 is the only one that was significantly associated. So you can see there's a query of a minor association there and there and there and there. But these aren't significant. But this one clearly is. And this is the gene sequence that we inherited from the Neanderthals. So that is um, a pretty clear, uh, convincing. Now, it is a correlation, but, it, but it's, a pretty, it's a pretty convincing correlation. And I think you would uh, agree based on that graphic so this is the uh, the major the, the 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 only one the major risk factor or the major risk factor for severe symptoms in terms of genetics and the risk is confirmed by a genomic sequence of about 50 of these genetic 50,000 of these genetic letters now i'll just show you what we mean by these genetic letters so i went to the welcome institute in uh, london and here they have, uh, they've typed out all the books of life, the so-called books of life. Now, each of these numbers represents a chromosome. So the one we're interested in would be uh, number three, which is, is that on there? Is it t- it's not in my picture, it's tucked in down at the bottom. Anyway, these, so for example, chromosome 11, these are the books. These are all the letters in chromosome 11. Um, and then when you look at the books, um, you can open them. And you can browse them and they've got all the letters inside and if we look a bit closer you can see that these are all the letters the genetic letters that make up the human genome in all these books and um, i didn't count them all but there's give or take 3.1 billion of these letters this is the genetic instructions to make a human being in the deoxyribonucleic acid quite incredible 46 chromosomes, 3.1 billion units uh, of of instruction. Absolutely amazing. Um, 
and the risk one as we said is inherited from the undertiles. Now a haplotype is a group of alleles. Now an allele, now what happens is because you've got two, uh, two chromosomes, um, you've got a gene on either chromosome, one from your mum, one from your dad. Uh, the, the allele is one version of the gene, that's what an allele, uh, an allele means. So a haplotype is a segment of these alleles or genes uh, in an organism that are inherited together from a single parent, in this case all the way back to one single Neanderthal coupling with uh, an early human who just uh, arrived out of Africa. Whether it was a, uh, a Homo sapien sapien early human man or woman, we don't know. We, we just know that this, uh, th this copulation event took place. We don't know which way around it was. Um, be interesting to know, but we know, I don't think we ever will know that. And uh, this sequence, this 50,000 uh, letters, 50,000 letters, uh, sequence uh, is strongly associated with uh, each other in the population. In other words, they're inherited together. They're inherited as a group. So during uh, reproduction, the chromosomes do um, divide with each other. They integrate, um, but that they... Um, they, they do tend to do so more so at particular positions. So this group of 50,000 letters has been passed down in a lot of human beings intact for 60,000 years. And that increases the risk of getting severe COVID. Quite, quite, quite fascinating, quite fascinating. So the haplotype, this genetic risk for severe disease uh, from Neanderthals, 50% of people in South Asia India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, have at least one copy on one gene. Uh, only 16% in Europe and uh, only about 9% of uh, uh, American, uh, indigenous Americans, uh, so-called admix uh, uh, Americans, which is the official term used in the genetic uh, literature. Um, relatively small amounts. Now, of course, um, indigenous Americans, whether they're in um, Alaska or the Fijians down in Tierra del Fuego, or is it, whatever it is at the bottom of Chile, uh, we believe that they might migrated in from Russia across the Bering Straits and migrated down. Now, we don't know when. There's some fascinating information. Uh, I think someone's just found some footsteps in, in the Americas, which are 22,000 years old, predating uh, what had been assumed to be the colonization of America about 14, 15, more 15, 16,000 years ago. I'm being approximate now because it's not my field. But interesting, only 9% of them. But they, they do have the genes from Neanderthals, as do the Chinese, as do the Indians, as do I. <laughs> quite, quite amazing. Um, but people from uh, Bangladesh, 63% um, of them have one copy of the gene, so-called heterozygous. That means it's on one chromosome, but not the other. But 13% of people in Bangladesh have it on both chromosomes. So there will be one copy of the gene on both pairs of chromosome uh, three. One copy on either uh, chromosome, a homozygous uh, condition. Um, just because the gene is so prevalent. Now, why is the gene so common in Bangladesh? We would assume that uh, in the recent history in Bangladesh, or we would say for the last few thousand years in Bangladesh, um, or maybe longer than that, however long people have been in Bangladesh, really, in that area, um, that there has been some survival advantage associated with that gene or that gene sequence. So maybe it gives protection against some other disease. We don't really know that. We just know that there's a higher gene prevalence in that area. But there probably has been some selective uh, effect for that gene over the past uh, millennia. Um, serious point. Bangladesh is living in the UK twice as likely to die as other people in the UK. Uh, but this gene sequence is almost absent in East Asia. So in, in, typically when we talk about Asians in the UK, we're talking about the subcontinent, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. Typically when you talk about Asians in the United States, you're more talking about Koreans, Japanese, Chinese. So really uh, less common in East Asians. Um, and, and, and they have a lower death rate to prove it. Japan, remarkably low death rate. Now, there's another early group of humans called Denisovans. There was this, there was this cave uh, where a monk called uh, Dennis lived for a while. 
So uh, the cave was called the Denisovan Cave after this monk who lived there. But thousands and thousands and thousands of years before Denis was there, um, there, there was these uh, people that were called Denisovans, another early group of humans. Now, there's a lot of Denisovan DNA, for example, in uh, that they migrated down into the oceanic regions, into um, places like Papua New Guinea, Australian Aborigines, Melanesian people. They, 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 they've got quite a lot of Denisovan DNA in them, um, whereas Western Europeans tend not to have. So did it come from Neanderthals or Denisovans was a, a bit of a question from early humans. But uh, we actually know it's present in homozygous form, in other words, on both chromosomes, uh, from uh, the genome of uh, Vinajay, which is the name given to a Neanderthal, 50,000 years ago, uh, found in Croatia. And the, the bones, some of the bones and teeth of this individual Neanderthal were so well preserved, <clears throat> they were able to do a DNA sequence. And we have the full DNA sequence of Neanderthals. Quite incredible. So we can look at these sequences in modern humans and when they're the same as in the, this original Neanderthal, the, the assumption is that they came from that original uh, uh, Neanderthal, which were known to uh, interbreed with humans on, on quite a few occasions. But this particular gene just came from one, from one particular coupling at one period of time, two individuals, one child. That's how it got into the human. I'll be giving evidence for that later. So this was the founder of the clade. So what a clade is, is you start off with a, an individual there with a, um, with a particular gene, and that will be spread to other individuals, and that will be spread to other individuals. And what you end up is, is with a grouping descended from that uh, individual. That is a clade. So I, I for example, am a member of my, pet, my, my mother's clade, and a member of my grandmother's clade, and a member of my great-grandmother's clade, and so on. Um, now, Neanderthals and modern humans split over half a million years ago, so this is due to uh, them coming together again after that uh, period of time. Now, Dr. Dame James Davis, University of Oxford, one of the uh, the lead scientists in this uh, in this study um, we used the technique and it identified uh, virtually understudied a gene called LZTFL1 so they used a new genetic technique and this gene had basically not been studied before um, bear in mind there's 3.1 billion letters in in the genetic alphabet <laughs> so there is a lot to study so why would you study any particular one uh, particularly if you didn't have reason to uh, and at the time, this had not been linked to infection at all, but now it is. It's a single gene letter out of three billion letters. Quite amazing. This uh, tiny section of DNA doubles your risk of dying from COVID. So this is in this, uh, as we say, just under 50,000. It's it's, no, it's at position, position 45,000, uh, 818159 on chromosome 3. <laughs> so it's that letter uh, on that particular... It's the particular letter on chromosome 3. And it's only one of these letters that have been changed, which is really quite amazing. Um, it's a single change. If you've got a G at that site, it's low risk. So I'm more likely to have a G at that site, uh, white European, as opposed to Asian from the subcontinent. And if you have an A at that site, it's high risk. So it's just changing uh, a G to an A is the actual change. Now, as we've said, there's 50,000, can't see it, there you go. As, as, as we've said, there's 50,000 um, letters in the Neanderthal sequence, but it's only a change in one of those 50,000 letters that's caused the genetic difference. It's really, a, it really is a butterfly effect sort of thing, isn't it? Particularly interesting. And of course, the letters are uh, the letters in DNA are adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thiamine. So in this case, uh, if you've got a G, it's low risk at this site, at this particular site. And if you've got an A, it's uh, high risk. Um, this is what you call a single gene polymorphism. Uh, just one letter change. Quite um, quite incredible. But that's what it is. Uh, uh, gene changes uh, cell reaction to binding. 
Now, what happens here is th this genetic change. So what happens is, is we, as as you know, um, we have the we have the we have the cell. Let's just make this a little bit brighter. This is the trouble when the sun keeps going in and out. It's uh, <laughs> confuses things. So so what we have is we have the SARS coronavirus two there, as as we know, and we have the spike uh, proteins uh like that the the uh that the, we have the spike proteins on the sars coronavirus too like that that's the virus and the virus fits into the uh, ace2 receptor sites on the surface of the cell so that would be the surface of the cell there and that would be an ace2 receptor site on the surface of the cell and of course there's other ace2 receptor sites on the surface of the cell as well like this where the virus fits into. Of course, those receptors are there for other physiological reasons. Now, what seems to happen is, if you uh, have got the good immunity, um, what seems to happen is, when the virus fits, when the virus fits into this receptor site, that's the antigen, it actually is detected by this receptor site. And this receptor site sends messages, it's called secondary messenger systems, to the other um, receptor sites in the cell and maybe even via cytokines to other cells I'm not that I don't think we really know that yet but it check what it does is it changes the shape of these so when these are changing when these have changed shape uh, the virus can't fit into them anymore it's called a conformational change and that probably does go via cytokines to other cells so the the other cell instead of the uh, the receptor site being like that so it's a nice fit for the uh, the virus to get to get into it actually changes its shape so it's no longer a nice fit so it doesn't fit in anymore conformational change now i'm not sure about this cytokine link uh, but i can't really see the other way it will work now this is a new aspect of immunity i'm only just learning about it's only been known about for about the past 10 years or so in in immunology uh, but that's quite amazing so the virus uh, is detected causes a change in the shape of receptor that's triggered to other that's passed on to other receptors and passed on to other cells so that means of course if the virus comes along uh, to another cell here so if, the, if this is the virus spike protein now coming along i think you can see it's not going to fit so it's not going to be able to infect that cell to inject its rna to replicate i mean you really couldn't make this this up. This is a such a complex defense mechanism, and as I say, it probably applies against multiple uh, viral infections. A way that cells are defending themselves against viral infection. Quite uh, incredible. So um, it's called um, so the genes change cell reaction to binding of SARS coronavirus two into the ACE two receptor. They cause a conformational change. They change the shape of the receptor. In most people, this leads to the cell changing shape or the receptors changing shape. Conformational change reduces further viral binding. Therefore, the virus can't replicate. Uh, high risk variant, less or delayed conformational, uh, conformational change. So it looks like people with a high risk Neanderthal gene can't change the shape of their receptors as other people can. Therefore, the virus can prolifer proliferate more and they'll become more severely ill. Uh, so high risk variants, less or delayed conformational change. And um, we, uh, D Dr. James Davis did say at the science, Cheltenham Science Festival, uh, deaths around the world are hundreds of thousands to a million as a result of this uh, genetic um, change inherited from Neanderthals. Um, though, so we're working with Dr. Simon Underdown together, uh, the, the Neanderthal gene first infiltrated humans 60,000 years ago. One event, one breeding event, one child, and that's how it got in. Now, this is called introgression. Introgression is when genes from one species are introduced into another species. Now, we could spend a long time arguing about this, because if you were like me when you did basic biology, you might have learned that the definition of a species is any two organisms that can interbreed with each other. So, for example, um, we can't interbreed with uh, dogs because the 
or the genes wouldn't fit together, the different chromosomal numbers and things. We can only breed with people of the same species, but humans, of course, can breed with any other human being because we're the same species. So that raises the question, were, were Neanderthals the same species? Separate question, but, but quite interesting. But, um, but Dr. Underdown is saying that the more we learn about Neanderthals, the more similar they look to us. So you can imagine a group of migrating uh, humans, uh, early humans, humans that they're sometimes called Homo sapiens sapiens, would meet another group of uh, humans called uh, Homo sapiens neanderthalis, very similar. They, they probably wouldn't realise that they weren't the same as them, and nature would take its course, of course. Um, so I don't think we should be looking at this as a form of. Um, any, anyway, we won't go into that. But 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 um, it's it's uh, the, the, these uh, introgression effects or things happened multiple times. Now, I said that there's probably two to three percent Neanderthal genes in me, for example, um, and in you as well, but the ones in you could be different from me, especially if you live in a different part of the world. So if you put all the Neanderthal genes together, there's probably more than 50 percent of the Neanderthal genome present in modern humans, which of course is, uh, is, is, quite, is quite interesting, even though we only have two to three percent each so there's actually much more uh, Neanderthal uh, genetic material around in the world now than there was when there were <laughs> Neanderthals actually present. I would just so love to have met one. It'd just be uh, totally fascinating, but we never can. Um, so this introgression event means that the genes through this single coupling jumped into uh, Homo sapien lineages and have been there ever since. Uh, Dr. Uh, Davis again. Um, the reason that we know that it's uh, inherited as a block is it's, it's in, with 28 single letter changes. So this single letter change, this A and the G, actually comes with a, a block of uh, 23 letters that go together. And the odds of those coming together in the same way through another uh, introgression event are very uh, unlikely. So basically this was one event, one breeding event all that time ago causing all this uh, change. Uh, and you can track that all the way back. It has to be a single event. Just one uh, single breeding event. It's just so unlikely that you get all 28 changes at the same time. So there you go, quite fascinating. Um, the probability of someone getting severe SARS coronavirus 2 and dying is heavily influenced by genetics. The, ch the, ch the chances of death with this particular uh, gene variation, genetic variation, doubles. 60% uh, more likely to be hospitalised. And uh, it comes all the way from uh, Neanderthals. The reason it's probably been preserved all these years is it will have advantages for other infections and things. A lot of human immune genes actually came from uh, Neanderthals. The reason that humans were probably so successful in radiating around the world was when they came out of Africa, they actually picked up a lot of uh, Neanderthal genes which were important for immunity. So they were probably very important, but for this particular um, for this particular infection, having that variant is pretty bad news. Uh, practically, people with this genetic variation need to be all the more fastidious about trying to reduce their other uh, potential risk factors. So there you go, found that a fascinating integration of uh, science and uh, health and uh, just, just a fascinating area of human history. Thank you for watching.